couldn't see Patrick anywhere. Shone my flashlight out to the old, the island of pilings. And I saw Pat's head bobbing as he was heading out to the island swimming. And I shouted out, Pat, what are you doing? It's, it's midnight. Why are you going swimming? He turned back to me and said, don't you see him? I'm swimming out to him. And he kept swimming. And I looked at the island and there were some gnarled branches. I didn't really see anything moving. So I kept my flashlight on Pat as he got up, climbed on the island, and walked over to one of the, what I thought was a root. But I don't think it was. And I know that because it started to move. And Pat turned to me and he shouted, he said, it's a man with a beard. And then he was gone. It's not like I heard a scream or anything. He was just gone. I swam out to look for him. He wasn't there. I went back to the tent and I thought, he must be playing some sort of a joke on me. But I couldn't find him. He didn't show up then or the next day. So that next morning I went to Goldbridge and I talked to the sheriff and the sheriff and the deputy came out and looked around. Couldn't find anything. He said that he'd run away. And it is true that he was doing a bit of drugs. He dealt it a little bit when he was younger, had a bit of a record. But I knew he hadn't run away. Something had happened to him. So the police didn't do anything. The, even his parents said that he'd run away. I went to the library in Goldbridge and did a bit of research. I looked into what had happened when the dam had been built and the water had risen. And I found out about a man called Old Man McGillicuddy. He'd been a miner back in the 20s and the 30s. And in 1933, when the dam was built, he'd refused to leave. The sheriff and the deputy had actually had to come out and arrest him and put him in jail because he refused to leave his, his cabin by his mine. Well, somehow during the night he had escaped. And the next day, when the sheriff heard the explosion and the water started to rise, they realized that he had escaped. And as the alarm sounded that was to warn everyone that the water was rising, the sheriff and the deputy headed out in their police car to old man McGillivetti's cabin. And they drove to the end of the road, right where we are now walked down to the cabin, and there was old man McGillicuddy sitting out in front of his cabin on his old rocking chair. The sheriff and deputy said, we've got to take you in. Take me in, old man. And they went to grab him, and they reached him, and they started to pull him. He only weighed about 80 pounds, he was an old man, and they took him. And they got about three feet, snap, got pulled back, they looked down. He had chained himself to his foundation with a two-inch thick chain. Already the water was starting to rise. It was lapping at their feet. Well, the sheriff and the deputy, they tried their hardest. It ended with them holding old man McGillicuddy's head above the water. And then they had to go. They had to go and take their car, get it out of there. It was getting wet. To be honest, they probably just looked at each other and said, this man's not worth it. And the last thing they saw was his old gray beard trailing in the water as he drowned. But he said to them, I curse you for what you've done. He died that night, or they thought he did. They never found his body. The divers came, nothing there.
you would have thought that was the end of it. But two years later, 1935, the sheriff was driving along Silo Lake Road on that very night, October 17th. Now, I don't know the true story. Alcohol may have been involved. All I know is his car ended up at the bottom of the lake. They never found his body. And he never reappeared. The deputy, probably scared at what had happened to the sheriff, decided to move way south. He moved to Florida, apparently. And there he lived until about the age of 53 or 4. And in 1962, his wife told this story. Driving along a highway close to the water there, he said, I see him. I see him. And he drove his car right into the ocean. His wife, she got out. And she said that his his seatbelt wasn't even attached. He could have got out too. But he didn't. And as his car sank with him in it, she heard him say one more time, I see him. And then he was gone. And when they brought that car up, they never found the body. So old man McGilguddy, he got his revenge in those two. And that brings me to where I am tonight. I'm back here because I know my friend was taken by old man McGilguddy. And I'm here, I'm going to spend the night and I'm going to see things through to the end. The last 25 years, I've had very few nights where I've slept soundly all the way through. Sometimes at night I'll wake up. And I'll look over and I'll see an old man with a long gray beard. And I'll think it's a dream. But when I wake up, there's water on my bedroom floor. But my psychiatrist says, it's all in my imagination. I know that it's not. I've had my dreams. I've heard the footsteps. I've seen the water on the bedroom floor. But I agree with the psychiatrist. I do have to spend the night here. I do have to face my fears. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sleep the night, and if I make it through, then I know. Pat just disappeared. He went somewhere. So it's time for you to go. I have to go right now? I need to do this myself. You're so bossy. Let's go. Okay. See you in the morning. The next day, as soon as the sun came up, I got in the uh, car, went out to get him, because I knew he'd probably be wanting to come home for a nice coffee. The tent was there, and the tarp. I could even see a few footprints around, but he wasn't there. I looked, called the local people. I haven't seen him since. He's gone. I wake up in the morning, though. There's co there's wet, wet footprints on the floor. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to make of that. 